So today's going to be an interesting day, hopefully. This is not a fast-moving video, so if you're in a rush, you might want to save it for later because I'm going to walk you through installing bees in my observation hives inside this, my way to bee building. So the whole purpose in here is to be able to observe and study bees any time of the year from inside. So I have three observation hive entrances here on the south-facing wall of the building. Each of the hive configurations, the entrances, are distinctly different so bees can find their way. One of these observation hives is already populated, but these are four levels of medium frames. And they're in triples. That's a really good idea. I populated these earlier. You can tell this is not a new install. This is a collection of bees that came from a swarm on a tree. So we've got these hived up. We know that they've got a queen. They're bringing in pollen through the entrance at a rapid rate right now. You can hear them venting, has a single entrance. There are two vents in the top of these. We'll show you the details of these observation hives later. The sizes of the frames will differ. The hive configuration is basically the same. So this is uh, a triple that holds deep frames. So three sets of three. So we have nine deep Langstroth frames in here. And we're using Premier Foundation. And some frames are foundationless, and that's because the whole purpose of having observation hives in this building is so that we can observe the bees doing all the things that bees do, and that will include building comb from scratch without foundation. A little guard bee in there. I want you to notice that the bees we're looking at in here don't appear too settled, do they? And that's because I tried to lure a swarm in here using synthetic queen mandibular pheromone, and that failed. What happened was uh, a bunch of bees departed from their swarm, followed the QMP. I put it in one of the vent screens at the top, which is a feeder hole. And these bees attached themselves to a synthetic queen. So really there was no queen. And when I removed that synthetic queen, because I'm about to do a new install, they got upset. A lot of them were walking around with K-wing. They're in disarray, but we're going to fix that. But it gave you an opportunity to see what bees are like when they lose track of their queen how the conduct inside the hive is completely different and I'm going to walk you through it. These two hives are exactly the same other than the entrance that goes into the hive on the side passing through in one case four inches of solid wood the other one is six inches of solid wood and the entrances of course are different the middle one has a three-quarter inch diameter entrance and this one here that we're looking at has an inch and a quarter diameter entrance. They all have screens on the bottom with inserts that we can pull out to look at the droppings there. They all have access tubes with a gate that I control. This would allow me to install a new queen if I needed to later on, or whatever would require me to have access to the hive from inside the building. I'm also going to show you how these sides open, the glass panels, the way it comes. The plexiglass is already installed, much different from the Bonterra bees observation hive the swing view that I've had in the past where you have to buy everything yourself later. Also the holes do not come pre-drilled on this hive. You have to drill it yourself. I think that's a great idea because they don't know necessarily how we're going to configure it. And this is the blinder here so you can close it up so your bees will have the sense of being in the dark. It does leak light around the edges. So I'm going to be reviewing these observation hives, I pay full price for them. Bottom, I have no affiliation whatsoever with the manufacturer. And these are galvanized, it looks like uh, number eight hardware cloth here. And that's part of IPM. It also provides a little venting because you can't close it off and make it airtight at the bottom. There will be no vents through the top. And now we're looking through to see how thick it is. Solid wood there, I expect them to propolize that because it's nice and rough and it angles down. So rainwater, snow, and everything else that's going to come our way will not be able to blow straight into the hive. These will be in insulated envelopes through winter. There are two feeders on the top feeder accesses, and they're supposed to be sized for your quart ball jar smallmouth lids. That is a very tight fit for that. But once again, number eight, hardware cloth. And this is where I put the QMP pheromone on the other hive to draw the bees in, and it worked. But it will not work to attract a swarm because a queen would perceive that as a competing queen. And then you get a bunch of queenless bees in there. So bad idea. Look at the view we have from the porch right here looking into the apiary. And we're going to get out here and we're going to collect the bees that we need to populate the hives. I'm using the hive butler tote. This is the screen top version. 
And of course, I only need two or three deep frames from each nucleus. That's going to slow them down a little bit. And I have to bring replacement frames with me. Wooden frames with Premiere Foundation. I think if you've watched me for a while, you know that I like Acorn and Premiere. I'm reviewing Premiere also just to see how the bees take it, but so far they work at exactly the same as they did the Acorn. So there is really probably no preference between the two. I think they work equally. But you could transport a swarm in one of these Hive Butler totes, but I like the fact that I can stick frames in here, and I'm going to use it to transport frames from one of these nucleus colonies into the building. Makes it very easy to do. So let's get into it. I looked over all of them. I have six nucleus hives out here. I'm showing you a frame holder that won't fit here because the hives are too close together. Going to use pine shavings. We're using smoke today. We could use sugar syrup as warm as it is. The other thing is, uh, here's my hive tools. Notice how clean they are. We don't want to uh, transfer any potential diseases, even though I think we'd be just fine. I use my torch, heat them up, wipe them off with a cotton cloth, and I'm good to go. So this nucleus hive, these bees made it through winter. I use these to pull frames of brood, eggs, whatever I need for any colony that needs them. And these are five over fives and they are really getting densely populated right now. So of the six nucleus resource hives I have, these two right here, the center one and the one on the right are the most populated. That's R10, two inch rigid foam wrapped with duct tape. And that's what we did through winter, just insulated the top, put that on there, and they came through strong. No supplementary feeding. Uh, you notice there's no feeder hole on this. And these are migratory covers. I'm just going to pry that up, and I'm going to make a selection here. If I can find the queen, and it says queen marked on the end there, but that's from last year. We have uh, replaced queens in this. Every time I try to do a split or take resources for a colony that's queenless, I would just assume pull the queen from one of these nucleus hives and then I can put her in and it satisfies their instinct to swarm and then they can of course build their resources back up which they do very fast. This is just standard Langstroth thickness, you know, three quarters inch thick wood. This is uh, preserved with eco wood, that mineral finish. And we're also seeing how that holds up through the years here. And uh, look at the bees, they're pretty calm little light smoking there and notice that uh, you don't hear any of the hive uh, noises and that's because this particular camera I had it set up for an auxiliary microphone which was not connected therefore it didn't record any audio so you get to listen to my narration here so what I like to do notice that there's a space on this end so we start with the end frame pull it away from the next frame and that's going to help us keep from rolling any bees and in particular we don't want to roll the queen when we find her and remember this is a top box there are five deep frames also below this one so we're going to look at this there we see right away that we've got some drone comb and we've got workers on the right so drones on the left workers on the right and i'm going to give you a close-up view here so i'll come around and hold it up to the camera so you can see things closer and uh, tipping it like this, you could drip out some uh, unfinished nectar. But I'm trying to see into the cells and I need the sunshine to do that. If I had an extra hand or if I had a baseball hat on, I would uh, clip a flashlight onto that brim. Now we look up close and we do have open larvae, but we've got uh, drone brood. So that looks like those are drone larvae, the little Michelin men there nice and fat well fed there's eggs just below it there somebody's laying in a nice orderly fashion so we suspect that there's a queen in here if you had laying workers uh, they would be laying sporadically all over the place so this is worker brood over here we have nurse bees on that they're attending to everything looks good to me but i'd like to get the queen remember if we can and then we'll transport the queen into the observation hive so i'm going to show you everything i do here that's why this video is going to take a while. I don't want to rush it through it. Good news is we don't have a bunch of queen cells uh, rimming the edge of the brood frames here. And uh, because as populated as they are, remember we're doing this inspection around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2.30. And uh, that way we have most of the foragers out. And this is a very successful colony of bees. Good stock. 
So a great candidate to be putting them in. We're only going to pull a couple of frames because we want to give the observation hives, which are small, remember, they're about the size of a single deep. And uh, I want to give them lots of room to expand and build on their own. So I only need 5,000 or more bees to populate that. And when I calculate that 5,000 bees, I'm thinking about capped brood as well. So the face frame of each of these brood frames, you can have over 3,000 uh, potential bees from the capped uh, pupa there. And uh, we'll pull this out and give you a look at this frame too. Now you might wonder, Fred, why are you wearing those goat skin gloves today? Well, I got stung three times right off the bat, so I decided today's a good day for a bee jacket. Vented bee jacket. That's what I'm wearing. I would like to do this with my bare hands, but I also got stung right on the fingertip. Don't appreciate that. Uh, and another bee stung me on the forearm for no reason. Now we'll look at this frame. Remember, if I can find the queen, we're going to put her right in that hive butler tote. So holding it up to the light here, and we'll show you what we see. Now we've got some drone brood again, and uh, lots of pollen stored there, top left. And we're looking around here, more pollen resources. Very common to have a lot of pollen, and there's brood there, but that's drone brood. Come over here to the right, we have worker brood, open. And uh, remember, we had eggs on the other frame, so we know you've got a laying queen in there, at least within the last three days. Have some empty cells here, more capped worker brood over here, so that's a good sign. And we have grubs uh, at all levels there. So they'll be in the open state for about the first nine days after the egg has been laid. And there you can see the queen scooting across right at the top there. Now to the right. Now she's off screen. So I actually didn't notice the queen right away while I was looking at the bees. And I took a second look, just had a thought, maybe I should take a second look at this frame before I put it away in the box. And I don't see the queen there, but it seemed like she should be there, given all the brood and the fact that we have recent egg laying and things like that. It's a prime frame for where she should be. So I did notice her brought her back to make sure that you get to see it and there she is right in the middle walking along very young queen unmarked of course because she's new this year and she's actually pretty calm considering that uh, everything's been pulled up but I'm going to put her right in that uh, hive butler tote and then I'm going to have to find another frame with brood on it and put that right next to the frame with the queen on it and that's going to keep her in place there so that's all good to do and uh, also the hive butler tote has smooth interior surfaces so the bees tend to stay on the frames it makes transporting them around when you're working from hive to hive uh, if you're doing walk away splits things like that sharing resources putting them in a tote like that makes it very easy if we had a windy day it would be sheltered from the wind and so on so i'm just going to continue my inspection here just to see which of these frames i want to add to the one with the queen on it. So remember, I only need a couple of frames. I'd like to have a balance of, um, oh, if we could have lots of protein for the bees. So they are a little light on pollen. And uh, if you have a lot of pollen, they're gonna consume that when they're feeding, developing larvae. So it's important for them to have that, but I can tell you now, uh, since I've made this video, it is the 16th, June 16th today, uh, they're bringing plenty of pollen into this colony, so this transfer went really well, and the queen made it just fine. And so the two frames there, just like that, keep everybody together. And I think I may pull just one more to make sure they have a little extra resources, and then I'll be able to put empty foundation back in this top box. Now there is even more brood down in the lower box, uh, but I haven't checked up on that part of this hive. If I find what I need in the top box, I don't go below. So we're just adding this one. This wasn't a really loaded frame, but it gives them drawn comb to work with. And uh, now we have three frames. So the center frame can be warmed by the bees. And then the two outer frames are the ones with cold sides on each side. And that's why I like the observation hive with triple frames in it. Even though that makes them less visible to us, 
it's much more comfortable for the bees. They can regulate their temperatures better. And uh, I think they feel more secure. So that's why I tried to find an observation hive company that was making triples. Ventura bees, I couldn't even get a hold of them. Something's going on with their website. I don't know what's happening there. But also, the Banterra B swing view that I bought was over $800. These um, triples that I bought, ready to go, including shipping, were less than $300 each. So I could almost get three observation hives like this uh, for the same price of a single Banterra B observation hive. And these are triples and there's their doubles. They don't even offer a triple. They did have a garden hive, garden observation hive that I was interested in, but there again, the website uh, was labeled non-secure. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, I think we're gonna be okay. This building is gonna have several observation hives in it because I don't want there to be a time when we go in there to teach about bees when we can't see something going on that's relevant to the bee behavior we wanna know about. So there you go, three fresh frames. We push the occupied frames together. I don't want to split them apart because they do have brood in there. And even though today it's in the 90s, at the time of this inspection, it was in the 70s. So we want to take care of them, put the migratory cover back on. And of course those insulated covers, which are the reason I believe that they went through winter so well. And keep in mind, no supplemental feeding. I couldn't put fondant on these. I couldn't do anything. And uh, so all they had were the upper five frames. So we're talking about 30 pounds, maybe 25, 30 pounds of honey to get through winter. And they did that just fine. So maybe the bees don't need us as much as we think they do when they have a small hive configuration like this. And last year I just took resources from them every time they were full, just like we're doing here today. So let's move on. Now we're inside, you can hear the noisy grand monkeys in there this is the bench the bench is uh supports about 800 pounds those are maple planks there so i think we have structural support just fine for what we're going to need even when these are full of honey so we're pulling open the uh hive butler tote there and i'm going to load the frames right in it's actually very straightforward you would think they'd fly everywhere, but they really don't. They kind of cling to the frames. And as long as you're not dropping things, banging things around, that's uh, a very easy install. You don't have to take your observation hive outside, do the install, and then bring it back in. So you can just push them in there on your own. Remember, that's the end frame, not super. You can see lots of pollen on it, though. We do have drones. I just assumed they weren't starting off having to feed drones. But uh, in this case, I think we're fine. We have lots of worker brood about to come out here. So there again, remember the, the general benchmark for a eusocial colony is about 5,000. So we're gonna exceed that here. One thing I do not like about this observation hive design, look at the lack of space beneath the frame. I'd actually like to see a couple inches of space underneath that bottom row. And uh, Bonterra bees do a great job at that. Theirs is about two and a half inches of open space to the entrance. The other thing is, note the entrance on the end. You have to make sure that we're not pushing these frames right up against it. We want to have room for them to come and go through there. And uh, again, look how easy this is because the bees are staying with the frames. And then we just close it up. Now the panel that's got the plexiglass on it also has long screws. So when we tighten those up, that closes off the plexiglass panel. And then it has the little flat pieces of wood that we turn to close the uh, blinders on them too. So we're looking at, you know, a couple of inches of pine there. Nice and thick on the end. And then that, of course, uh, holds the hive together. And then you can slide in your bottom insert also because the side panels also compose the grooves for the removable insert at the bottom. So 
So it might be cool if they offered uh, to make these out of maple or maybe some upgraded wood. People like me would probably pay extra to get that. Now the next question is, what do you do with this little cluster of bees that's left behind in the hive butler tote? We just closed up the hive, so the plexiglass panels are shut. The blinds are closed, so we come outside here, and I thought it would be a great opportunity and a test of your patience to show you how these bees decide to go in this brand new observation hive entrance. Keep in mind, they've never been here before. If they were foragers, they would have just flown right off of the hive butler tote as soon as you took their queen away. And they would be looking around for that pheromone trail or they would just go back to their original hive. They certainly know the area. But by transporting a bunch of nurse bees in, we uh, end up with bees that don't know where they live. They've never been outside of the hive and therefore they're going to be just fine right here in a brand new location. And again, as I mentioned before, this is the south side of the building. So this will be the warm side through winter. And in the roof of this building, there are six dormers also facing south to capture that winter southern light. So that's going to be good. Now here's the test of patience. What I'm doing is the movie camera is on a tripod. I'm standing here holding the Hive Butler tote. So if you don't want to sit here and listen to the birds chirping and watch these bees take their sweet time figuring out where they live you can fast forward down to the comments section or in the video description i will give you the timestamp of where these bees end up inside but i thought it would be a great opportunity to see how the bees themselves figure out where they're going to go and i didn't realize i'd be standing here for so long So they wander around. Remember, everything is new. So the wood face, the entrance is new. They don't have a pheromone trail here. That one goes in, starts checking things out. What we need, and, and one of the ways that this is kind of cool to watch is because listen to the sounds the bees are making. And then later on, when they discover that the queen is actually inside that hive, they change the noises, they change their activity. You'll see Nasanoff glands open up on their abdomens, the very first segment from the end there. And once they start fanning that, you'll see these lost bees that are hanging out on the edge of the hive butler tote, wake up, smell the queen's pheromone, and then they all go straight into that entrance. So it's a very interesting lesson in kind of how bees conduct themselves, how dependent on pheromones they are. We got a few scooting in, checking things out, but remember, we have a pretty decent distance going in there to get to the hive. And the bees that are in the hive don't have any interest right away in checking out the exit, which I also found interesting. When you hive a swarm, of course, the uh, scouts and other bees that are resident to that new space, if you put them inside, they line up along the entrance, they open their Nesanoff glands, and then they fan out to make sure that any passerbys that are from their original colony that left with the swarm can find their way to the new location. Now, another thing I'll tell you, bees do not voluntarily like to move into observation hives. They're too small. Overall, this isn't an optimum cavity for them to move into, so, we have to do things like we did today by moving the frames in, or I collected a swarm in the first one that we showed with the Colorado Bee Vac, and then uh, took a handful of bees inside. Remember, we have the access tubes there, and you can put a handful of resident bees from the swarm through those tubes, and then they'll spread the pheromone that's familiar to the others. Then the others will pick up on that, and then they'll march into the entrance. Uh, with observation hives, uh, if you're hiving a swarm, we're really counting on them deciding to move into that space. So they kind of have to be desperate. Also, historically, uh, through the years, these observation hives are just swarm generators. By the time they build up their population and uh, become congested in there and all the frames are full and the brood is going great, now you get to watch swarm behavior. 
You get to see the population build. You get to see how they go from calm, sedate, and you know, somewhat tranquil. They become more animated, a little testy. The queen leaves. You can hear queen piping in the new cells that are made. And uh, then you get to see the cycle complete. Now the whole thing is, you want them to have a queen and you don't want them to be peaking out their population at the end of the year. Because what kind of dooms an observation hive is when they swarm out at the end of September, for example, because now if they're making a new queen, you're 30 days out or more from seeing new adult bees in an observation hive. So that kind of works against them. If they swarm out sometime late July, you still have time to recover from that because remember observation hives, we tend to put feed on top of them and uh, hopefully they won't overpopulate it too fast. So it's best to hold them back a little. I'm putting one to one sugar syrup on here. I'll show you that later. And that's just to make sure we have storms today, for example, so they can't fly. And this keeps them producing new comb because we put heavy wax foundation in there aside from the frames that we actually got from the nucleus hives. So this is a test of patience. They don't seem too bright. Bees are the biggest brained insects. They can figure things out. But here's this hole right there. Screws on either side of it looking like eyes. So they can walk right in that hole immediately. Take up residence. But it's not happening fast. Also, each of these hives, except the middle one, has a landing board for the entrance. They're all shaded on the entrance in case they decide to beard a little bit on the outside. They're sheltered from wind and rain. And I'll just let you listen to them, but we do have some guard bees here too. If you look down on the lower left, there are bees with their mandibles open and they think they're protecting something. I don't know what it is. But we have lots of time here to listen to the noises they're making. So it's going to be all the more prominent when they change that. Oh, this one. Oh, it comes back out. We need some inspectors in there. And we know that the queen herself is in there. She's a young queen, but look, we've got, listen to this. Look at the change. Look how many are going in now. Note the bee lower right there, fanning, and she's opened her nasonoff gland. See, she's lifting her abdomen. And now we get a couple of them to do that. They found their queen. Listen to the difference. And now look how quickly they respond in the lower left to the pheromone that's now being put into the air that this is where the queen resides. Now, can you smell that? I can never smell the QMP that comes off these nasonoff glands. But of course, bees, the slightest scent in the air, and they pick up on it. And then look how they all join in, spreading the same pheromone. But remember, it wasn't a swarm. We robbed a hive. We did what's called a walk-away split. And, uh... So if this had been a swarm, then this pheromone being spread into the air would catch stragglers that are hovering around. But instead, in this case, it just gets the stragglers out of the hive butler tote there. And they can all go in. That sound you heard was a yellow jacket wasp cruising by. This time of year, they're all building their nests up. I 
Why is that called the Nasanoff gland, by the way? Because there's an anatomist named Nasanoff. He discovered it, what it does, and got to have it named after himself. There are the last few stragglers finally taking their time getting out of the tote. There's that yellow jacket right there. And I may later put a block of wood over that entrance a little bit. Inch and a quarter is pretty large, so I might reduce it by half. I might just put something over that to make it more defensible for the bees. Now I can take the toad away. Mission accomplished. They're in. They're claiming it. Now we go back inside. These are the feeder holes, of course. I also like that that feeder hole is not dead center on top. Because if it ever dripped or leaked down into the hive when you didn't want it to, like on a cold day, it wouldn't drip directly on the cluster of bees. So they got that right with this design. And I had to use jelly jars because my quart mason jar lids would not fit those holes. Kind of annoying there. Now we've got three foundationless frames in here. We're going to have to pull those out and make room for the frames that we collected from the nucleus. And uh, these queenless bees in here will be just fine. When you install something that uh, is so overwhelming as frames with open brood, an actual queen when they're queenless, and uh, lots of nurse bees, you will see little to no fighting. And I'm going to leave the one uh, foundationless frame there. so that we can uh, watch them build comb. Now this is the second box we're occupying. Uh, so we pulled two frames from the middle nucleus hive out in the bee yard. So all in the same day, by the way. And look at the brood pattern on this one. Nice and loaded. That's why I only needed a couple of frames on this one. Lots of activity there. They did have a little queen cell down in the lower edge there. I decided to leave that on there. They come around so you can see what the other side of that frame looks like. A lot of hatch brood there. Lots of eggs on this one. Look how noisy they are. And we'll put a bunch of brood on here too. You hear my sticky feet? I put down cardboard here. So uh, if I spilled any sugar syrup or something like that, uh, it would be on that. So remember, we can't put the insert in until the glass panel is closed. Try to move slow so the bees can get out of the way. But it is amazing how easy it is. Look at how few bees are outside this hive. So walking in with a high butler tote, carrying those frames in, and uh, installing them was very straightforward. Pretty darn easy. Now, some observation hives are inside your house. I don't know if I'd walk in my house and do that. But in my way to bee building, uh, perfectly fine for them to fly out because they have lots of exits for them. Sliding in that insert. I thought it would be on camera, but it isn't. Bad videography there. But they're just core flute inserts that you can cut yourself. And uh, that's it. And look how many beads were left in the hive tote this time. Like none. One or two. So that's not bad at all. Let me show you the other side here before we close it up. Lots of brood. I think we're going to be good. So if you want to see how these progress, I will do periodical updates from time to time. I also hope to do my way to be question and answer videos in here in the coming weeks as things get finished up. There's a lot of work yet still to do in this building. 
and uh, having three observation hives in there is just great. It sounds awesome. So I hope you enjoyed watching and uh, stop back in and we'll give you updates on those observation hives. Have a fantastic week.